Okay. Come on in, ladies and gentlemen. Please take your seats. Please take your seats, please. We're going to get started now. So everybody, hope everybody can hear me in the back, and I hope you can all see if I'm staying seated here. Please come on. I know we've got a few other people who are going to trickle in, but uh, just a little housekeeping before we uh, get started. Please remember to turn off your cell phones or turn them to silent. Would you mind remember doing that? I'll remember to do the same. Uh, thank, and we're starting just a few minutes late. Apologies for that, but we will try to get you out on time. Um, thank you all for coming. I'm Keith Richburg, the director of the journalism program here at Hong Kong University, otherwise known as the JMSC. Um, this is uh, one of a series of events we put on. We're, in fact, uh, if you are around on Monday, we'll be putting on another event on U.S.-China relations in the, in the America First era. With, uh, our speaker will be David Ignatius, the foreign affairs columnist for the Washington Post, who actually is here joining us today for this event. So please sign up for that one uh, while there's still room. <laughs> Uh, tonight's event, uh, the protest in the press, maintaining objectivity in a polarized society. It's a, it's a fascinating topic, and I know all of you are interested because I can tell by uh, how many people have packed into the room here uh, tonight um, it's for this distinguished panel. The recent unrest in Hong Kong, triggered by the, the extradition law, has found the media uncomfortably at the center of attention. Um, reporters covering the protest uh, on the front lines have taken strong stands against the extradition bill and it sometimes have even been uh, subject to attacks, uh, tear gas, pepper spray, and harassed from doing their jobs with laser lights. Some have been subjected to online harassment. And there have been questions about objectivity of the press. Objectivity, as we know, is a core tenet of our profession in journalism, but a question remains, can journalists and reporters remain objective when the press itself has become a part of the story? And how fair has the coverage been? You know, how much of the protest coverage has been driven by social media and social media feeds and live broadcasts? How important are words that journalists use when they use words like anarchy, Hong Kong, in Hong Kong, chaos, riots, radicals? Are these the proper words for journalists to use and, and maintain objectivity at the same time? We're going to be talking about all of these issues. And, and, and the issue, the other question we'll be talking about is who really is a journalist in this age of social media, age of citizen journalism? These are things that we're all going to be discussing up here. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Who's a journalist? Who's a protester? Uh, these are all things. We're going to tackle all of these topics here, and we're going to uh, have a little bit of a conversation up here first among ourselves, and we're going to then uh, uh, open it up to questions from you. I want to remind everybody we are live streaming this, and we are uh, taking photographs. So if somebody doesn't want to appear on YouTube, please let us know. <laughs> and uh, with that, I want to just uh, introduce, first of all, this distinguished panel we've got to discuss all of these issues. I'll start on the far side down there with Professor Francis Lee. He's, the professor, uh, he's a professor and director at the School of Journalism and Communications at the Chinese University, and make, working mainly in the area of journalism studies, public opinion, and social movements. Uh, next to him is Anthony Dapperin. He's a Hong Kong-based writer and lawyer and author of the book City of Protest, A Recent History of Dissent in Hong Kong. That book was actually finished, I believe, uh, in 2014 or 2015. 2016, just, just after the umbrella movement. So uh, I, the word, word is that he's actually working now on an updated version or a new version of the same book. <laughs> and Anthony writes and he presents extensively on Hong Kong and culture. And you can read his, his, his pieces in The Guardian, Bloomberg Opinion, New Statesman, Foreign Policy, and elsewhere. Uh, next to Anthony is Jeffy Lam. Jeffy Lam is a correspondent, political reporter at the South China Morning Post, and she leads the newspaper's coverage on Hong Kong politics. I'm proud to say she's a graduate of the University of Hong Kong with a degree in social sciences, but she did not graduate with, uh, from our journalism program, but we could maybe try to correct that in the future. <laughs> and I always say if you want to follow what's going on in Hong Kong politics on, and the protest and you're not following Jeffy Lam on Twitter, then you're doing it all wrong. Next to her is uh, Damon Pong. Uh, he's a journalist at Radio Television Hong Kong, which I'm sure you've all been tuned into daily to get your protest feeds. He spent 14 years in the media industry. The majority of his time is a multimedia journalist at RTHK, and he specializes in politics as well, although I lately think he's been specializing on protests and front lines and, uh, and how to survive tear gas and pepper spray. And uh, next to me is not Christy Lou Stout, has, as advertised, <laughs> because she was unfortunately unable to make it. But fortunately, stepping into her shoes, we have Erin Hale. Erin Hale is a freelance journalist who's based in Asia since 2013. 
uh, and she is an alumnus of the J journalism program, the JMSC, Master of Journalism, and she covers Hong Kong for German and UK media, and she's been all over the place and also has been learning how to deal with pepper spray and tear gas over the last uh, few months. So without further ado, uh, uh, Francis, can I start with you? I'll just sure. pose a question first out. I mean, talk to me uh, about, you've, you've actually looked at how, uh, with these protests, uh, people are getting their news in a different way uh, than in the past. C explain what you've found. Um, I, I guess, you know, instead of commenting on the press performance, maybe I can start with uh, kind of outlining the environment, I mean, the environment in which the press uh, has found itself uh, 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 these days. Uh, basically, these are, you know, I, I actually have just two slides, I mean, so, uh, not too many. Um, basically, this is actually um, um, the survey data from uh, the survey that we conducted just uh, in the past week. I actually just got the data this afternoon at 1 p.m. Uh, and created this chart. Now, basically, what, what it shows is this. You know, in this uh, survey, it's actually a population survey. So it's a random sampling of Hong Kong public. Okay? And in that survey, we asked uh, people you know, to uh, rate the importance of uh, different channels, okay? uh, how important these different channels are as information channels uh, related to the movement. I mean, uh, um, so basically, the seven, I'm, I'm sorry for the very, very small font size. Okay? Even I cannot, you know, can hardly. <laughs> but basically, you know, if I remember correctly, so um, on the left-hand side, the first bar is um, um, traditional media. So radio, newspaper, whatever, okay? Traditional media, conventional media. The second bar, the highest one is actually live broadcast. Okay, so people rate the live broadcast as the most important uh, channel of uh, protest-related information to them. And then the third bar is uh, Telegram. The fourth bar is uh, other messaging apps, and of course, in the Hong Kong context, for the local, it basically, it basically means WhatsApp, mostly, okay? Uh, the fifth one uh, um, um, in the middle, uh, relatively tall, uh, social media sites, again, in the Hong Kong context, is primarily what means Facebook, for, at least for the locals, to a lesser extent, Twitter for, for the expats. And then uh, the sixth one it would be the forum, the online forum that has been uh, regarded as playing a very important role in this current protest, that would be uh, that forum. And then the seventh one, the last one, is uh, other forums, okay, just any other uh, 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 internet forum. So again, I mean, the, 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 I think a very simple point here, what we can see is that live broadcasts really stand out as the most important kind of uh, information uh, uh, source for most people. And, and that's not difficult to understand, because with the frequency of all the clashes, with also the kind of mobility like, you know, we say free water, like, so, so the kind of very flexible, fluid kind of products going on. So we do rely, I mean, people did rely a lot on, you know, the uh, uh, journalists at the front line doing the live broadcast. And they felt like the live broadcasts were unedited and so can tell them something that is real, okay, rather than, you know, the edited version, people might start thinking about what's going on behind the, 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 editor, uh, behind the editorial process. Now, the second slide, the, the next one, Okay, just two slides, uh, uh, and the next one. Um, basically, it's the same thing, but I have broken down into three groups of people, broken down uh, 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 all respondents into three groups, okay? So the first group, the blue bar, represents protesters. Uh, here, in that context, in the survey context, it means people who have participated in at least one protest activity in the past two and a half months. Um, the bar has to be low, otherwise, you know, the number of people won't be that much. Um, but if we set the bar reasonably low, so uh, uh, who have ever participated in at least one product activity in the past three months, that actually constituted close to 40% of Hong Kong public. Okay, so that's the blue bar. And then the orange and the gray bar, okay, the orange and the gray bar are both non-participants who have not participated in any activities at all. But the difference between the orange and the, and the gray bar is that um, the orange bar are people who did not participate in a protest, but who rated the Hong Kong government very lowly. So they are non-participants, but they are critics of the government. Okay? So the gray bar are, uh, represent people who are non-participants, and they rate the government relatively highly. So they are the actual supporters of the government. So these are the, the three groups. And again, the seven uh, 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 groups are just the seven channels that I talk about. And I think a, a couple of points that we, I, I can, you know, we can highlight here. Now, obviously, for the protesters, you can see, they actually are much more uh, uh, active in collecting information from basically all kinds of sources, okay? So the blue bars are basically, all, in all seven groups, they are the highest, they are the tallest, okay? So the protesters are getting information, have been getting information 
from a much wider range of sources than other people. And actually, for, for the, for the, uh, uh, for the protesters, you can also see that uh, following live broadcast, the second most important source of information is actually social media, rather than traditional media. Okay, so you know it's actually followed by 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 uh, um, social media sites, and actually uh, Vim Dang got very close to traditional media, the, the uh, uh, forum. Um, so that is the case for um, uh, the protesters. And if we look at the other extreme, the gray bars, okay, the um, the uh, um, actually government supporters, okay. So we can see that for the government supporters, even live broadcast and traditional media are more or less equally important to them. Okay, followed by, okay, still followed by other messaging apps. Okay, uh, a lot of pro-government people, actually including my, my, my parents-in-law. Uh, 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 <laughs> uh, no, they're, they're, they're deep blue, really, okay. Uh, <laughs> really, okay, yeah, I, I know, okay, okay, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's on record, they know that. <laughs> okay, uh, um, and they actually got a lot of just like a lot of you know, uh, 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 supporters of government, they do get a lot of information, a lot of video clips, a lot of uh, different messages from, uh, uh, actually from WhatsApp, okay, as far as I know. So, uh, but, but I think, again, I mean, the, the general point at the beginning, as an opening, is just to say that the press, I, I, I guess, the, it, it's actually very hard to, to evaluate. It makes the performance of the, uh, uh, um, of the press even harder, and also makes the evaluation of the press performance actually very hard. Because it's not like the press, you know, if, if we ask uh, uh, whether the press has done uh, 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 very good stories, meaningful stories, I think obviously yes, okay. But the problem, the challenge is whether people are actually paying attention to those stories, to those more comprehensive, more, you know, uh, 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 with all the, the, the fact checking and things like that, or that kind of better stories. Rather, it seems like in the past two and a half months, uh, the Hong Kong public has been basically paying attention to live broadcast and then really fragmented information mm -hmm. from a range of sources. And I think that is just actually what is the basis of the challenge mm -hmm. for the press. And, I think that's the stop. Thanks. And, and these live broadcasts, you're talking the Now TV live feeds now, and the RTHK cable, cable. RTHK and actually also the online media, Stan News or, or, um, and uh, Hong Kong Zero One and right, a, a, a range of, actually, you know, the live broadcast, because this is actually so easy, right? I mean, uh, uh, I have been, I personally have been in a couple of occasions, mm -hmm. I, w I was actually watching live broadcast by my own friends. Mm -hmm. they, they happened to be there, mm -hmm. okay, and then they were on the site, and then they started doing that mm -hmm. uh, 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 live broadcast, and because it's not the, the really the biggest event, so mm -hmm. they were there, and they were actually quicker than the press, mm -hmm. because they just happened to be there, mm -hmm. right? So, so they can actually capture and live broadcast the beginning of, mm -hmm. of the conflict, and I was even paying attention so it's, it actually goes back to the question you just raised, I mean, who is a journalist, right? And who can do a live broadcast, you know, these days, it's basically virtually everyone. Right, yeah. We'll get back to that, because that's fascinating. But first, I want to bring Anthony in, into this conversation, because you, you, as I mentioned, you literally wrote the book on protests, <laughs> called City of Protest. If you write the next edition, based on what's happening now, in that chapter on the media, what are you going to say is the big difference you see? Um, I, I think what's been interesting about the current protests and, and I guess what people focus on a lot is is the violence or well, the violent clashes of the current current protests is um how performative they've been um, it's almost balletic and there's almost a a script as to the way a, a given protest day will unfold it starts with a, a peaceful rally if that's been allowed later in the day the the more hardcore protesters will build barricades and so you have a second you know, a building barricade act then in the next act you know the police will line up and face them and then the act after that there'll be some throwing of objects and some shooting of tear gas and then the police will come through and do their charge and clear and the protest will be water and disappear and it's this very much a set script um, that every protest seems to follow in a way, um, such that it kind of becomes this, this performance art. Um, and so, you know, the media, therefore, if, if you say this is a performance, then there needs to be an audience, and the media, in a way, have been playing the role of, of being the audience for, for these, these, these performance acts, and, and of course, through live streaming them, you know, bringing them to a wider audience. But then what I think has been um, interesting, and which we, we didn't see in the Umbrella Movement, was the next stage of the press actually becoming part of the act. Um, once the press started to be, you know, 
collateral damage between you know between the protesters and, and the police, whether they were getting hit by, by by tear gas or other objects, or finding themselves caught between the protesters and police. You know, the, the media then sort of took up this active role as, as members of the performance, and sort of the fourth wall was broken in this way. So I think it's it's interesting that you know the, the, the press have in, in many ways become part of the story in the way that they weren't uh, in the umbrella movement um, in this sort of theatre of, of protest that, that we've been witnessing. Um, the other thing, just to, uh, the sort of other point I wanted to make, just in, in terms of the, the position of the press, and, and it, it goes to the objectivity of the press, is the, the position that the press have found themselves in in, in this particular protest movement, um, I think in many ways is analogous to the position that the police have found themselves in. Uh, what we've had much more so this time around than in 2014 is a complete vacuum of government, an absence of government. Basically, the Hong Kong government has disappeared. And there have been, there was a stretch for as long as two weeks that Carrie Lam didn't appear in public at all. Um, you know, at most, she, she or her ministers will appear at, at one press conference a week and make basically the same statement every week. So there's no information coming from the government. The government is not interfacing with its populace. Um, and so that has left the police in the uncomfortable position of being th the sole interface between the government and the people, which is a position that the police shouldn't be in, and that's led to, I think, many of the, the criticisms of the police. But it's also left the press as the interface between the public and sort of the, 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 the society at large. Um, and so th this has sort of pushed, I think, the press into this role of, of commenting on the story and reporting the story, but also being part of the story and, and feeding people's hunger for, for leadership in a complete absence of leadership from anywhere else um, in society or from the government at the moment. I think that's created a, an interesting dynamic for the press as well this time around. So. And, and some of the media organizations like the, uh, the Foreign Correspondents Club, the Hong Kong Journalist Association, they've been pretty vocal criticizing police actions directed against journalists and often staging their own marches or a silent march. How does that affect the coverage, you think, if journalists are also you know, out there saying, hey, police, stop shooting tear gas at us. You know? it, it does, it does, yeah, it does blur the line, doesn't it? Um, and, and having, yeah, sort of thinking about how you need to maintain objectivity while being thrust into the stories is an interesting challenge. I, I should say, though, that many of the press appear to be also often thrusting themselves into the story more than is advisable. And if you see, you know, a, a wide angle shot of any of these protests, you'll often see there's actually more press than protesters on the site. You'll see a line of police, you know, about 100 people in yellow high-vis vests, and then about three blokes in black t-shirts 100 meters away. Um, and then the press sort of complain, you know, why are the police attacking the press? It's like, well, you know, to be fair, um, <laughs> there comes a point, right? So, yeah, but um, yeah, certainly it's a challenge. Well, Jeffy, let me bring you in here for a minute now. I, we've just heard from uh, Francis that uh, people are reading the SCMP less and getting more of their news off social media and various apps, but I see you on Twitter all the time, and I know, what, I know what's going on by following your tweets, and I don't even have to read the newspaper the next day. I mean, so what, how do you cover, I mean, are you, are you a journalist on Twitter? Are you a journalist on the newsroom? How, do, how, do you, how does this all feed together now? Uh, with Twitter, everybody, I guess Damon also have been tweeting a lot of time because right. Twitter is such an important tool for us to get the news out immediately. I can tell you, like, um, on July 21st, actually, I have taken a day off because I have scheduled a playgroup tour so, <laughs> so for my baby. Mm -hmm. And then, like, actually, there's a huge, massive protest in Shanghai where they defaced the national emblem outside the liaison office. So it's a big day. Mm -hmm. So at night when I put my baby in bed, and so finally I can switch on to the TV to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I saw all the tear gas in Siam Poon, but then I started to check my Twitter as well, and then suddenly someone, I think it's not a journalist, but someone, mm -hmm. had been live streaming, uh, live streaming what's happening in Yunlong, which is exactly downstairs of my home. Mm -hmm. And I, like, at that time, I didn't really see any news alert or live broadcast from the major television, uh, radio, or even online media. So. It's such an important tool because like, let, it lets you know what's going on. And immediately, I just call my mm. boss, like, do you have anybody? Because basically, we have the whole team in, mm. on the Hong Kong island. So mm. with Twitter, I can at least like, mm. cover the second half of the attack mm. in Yunlong. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you, 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 you kind of anchor a lot of these stories that are uh, taking mm. place everywhere. It's like water. And you kind of, your, your job and yeah. the other reporters to sit back and kind of put the day's news together. How difficult is that? When it's you <laughs> so difficult in terms of manpower deployment. Uh -huh. I can say because there's so many battlefields in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. and you never know 
which one is the real battlefield. Mm -hmm. Like on July 21st, we thought every, everyone would be in liaison office, but in the end, it ended up in Yunlong. And on August 31st, no one would know we should actually send someone to Prince Edward. Mm -hmm. So by the time when we watched the live broadcast, we saw some, something is wrong out there. We asked our colleagues to go there, but the MTR already immediately, uh, they already declared to like close the station and like a lot of journalists cannot make it inside the station. So it's very difficult for us. And I can give you a very, uh, a, an example of the flash mob protest, which they launched on August 4th. Um, at, on that day, I think originally everybody is uh, gathering in a rally in Siampu. It's supposed to be a rally, but of course, it ended up it become a road blockade where they move all the way to Shenwan. Mm -hmm. And I followed them then from Shenwan, Hong Kong U, tear gas, and then they took the MTR to Causeway Bay. Mm -hmm. And then they ran all the way in Wan Chai to uh, vandalize the Golden Bohemia Square. And then they blocked the Cross Harbor Tunnel exit. Mm. And then they decided, oh, where should we go next? And someone suggested, why not go to Wang Dai Xin? Mm -hmm. um, but then they said, oh, there are a lot, already a lot of cops. And then like, let's move. Mm -hmm. And then they moved all the way to Kowloon East. And on MTR, they saw someone, they, they, they saw the, basically the traffic on the Kowloon East are already paralyzed because someone have already set some roadblock over there. And so, uh, there are a lot of cops and there's not much we can do, so why not go to Meifu? Yeah. And I was like, what, Meifu? <laughs> like, you know, like, I'm, I'm not having a protested mindset. I'm, I, I really have no idea why, why you would go to Meifu. I, and I talked to someone like, uh, why are you going there? Uh, it's a quiet neighborhood, uh, pan-democrat stronghold, uh, no police station, so why are you going there? Mm. Hey, you know, you'll find something to do when you arrive there. <laughs> so indeed, indeed, like the moment <laughs> I, 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 when we arrived in Meifu, like a whole train full of protesters, they immediately know what to do. They just like get out of the exit, block the Lychee Court Road with roadblocks, someone mm. like vandalized the traffic lights, mm. and then they just vanish in 10, sec uh, 10 minutes. Mm. So if I were not on the same train with them, I would have missed everything already. Mm -hmm. So, Wow, that yeah. sounds like democratic protest, right? Oops. <laughs> Uh, they, they decide where they're going to go next. Yeah. Do you still have lights on? <laughs> uh, 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 there we go. Someone Did someone lean on the light switch? <laughs> <laughs> the police commissioner Lowe didn't like your last answer. <laughs> uh, Damon, you're, you're a heavy social media user, and you've been also out there on the front lines, I think, since the very beginning, right? Let's, how do you... Let's, and he's tweeting right now. I'm, I'm just, I just have my Twitter on, like, because Jeffy was talking about, like, how I've been, or Keith, I've been talking about how I've been on Twitter so much. I was just looking back at my figures, like, at the very start of the, of the whole protest on the 9th of June, I remember I taking a screen cap on my Twitter feed, and I had, like, 1,400 followers at that time. And three months later on Monday, I had 7,700 and today it is 7,900. So, so you get a picture, it's like kind of went five, six times more than what I used to have. So, but I didn't start like, I should have started like during Umbrella Movement, but I didn't start until 2015. Yeah. But uh, just kind of following what Jeffy said and, and Keith's questions to her. Um, sometimes I get complaints from my boss. Like my editors will sometimes say, hey, you're feeding too many stuff on your Twitter, but you're not sending stories back. <laughs> like, like, it's like when you're on the ground, or sometimes when you write Twitter, like because of the, like you have a character limits, you can't write more than 15, 150 characters, I think. So, so you kind of, and for, we, we gen generally write as a radio journalist, slightly different than what the print journalist is. We tend to write shorter stories. So Twitter is like the best way that we write like short, concise, to the point, kick out all the unuseful information. If you want, you can start a thread uh, for background and stuff, but, but you try to just you know upload a picture and, and send whatever you have. Uh, but my editors are saying, hey, uh, you gotta remind yourself to, to be sending stuff over as well. But because I guess when you're on the front line, you're kind of too excited and, mm -hmm. and there are just too many newsworthy stuff going on. Mm -hmm. So you kind of tweet, very often, and then, oh, right, I got to surf, surf the newsroom as well, and then I remember to send stories then. Mm -hmm. But but it would be, yeah, li like, it's kind of a little dilemma, which is kind of strange. We, we should be always thinking about the newsroom first, but, mm -hmm. but nowadays we kind of 
-hmm. go to Twitter first and then mm -hmm. go back to the newsroom. Yeah, and let me, let me just follow that up with a question. If you go through the newsroom, you have an editor who's gonna look at your story first and make sure it's, all the words are accurate, et cetera, and you're gonna make sure everything is verified. On Twitter, it's rapid fire. You see something, you put it out, you can correct it later. Is that how it works on Twitter? Or? Yes, but I mean, I have to speak personally. I just try very, very hard to maintain, number one, objectivity and credibility. So, uh, of course, I make sp spelling mistakes here and there. And, you know, by the time I notice it, somebody already retweeted it like 20 time, 10 times or like you don't really want to take it down. Or when you take it down, people will, people will start questioning, hey, why do you take your stuff down? Yeah. So, so uh, you know, I try to make corrections here and there. Uh, but, uh, I mean, like, I'm, I'm just, again, speaking for my, my own self. Uh, uh, I try to keep, like, my Facebook private and my Twitter, like, as a public interface to, to people. So when, like, say, pro-government people want to wanna comment on my stuff, they can. Well, like, when, when there are so many uh, pro-protest people who are sharing stuff and, and pointing fingers at the police, say, uh, this and that, uh, you know, that I, I just try to not include any personal views on, on my on, on Twitter so so that people can think, oh, this is just news and, and not a like a personal mm -hmm. expression kind of thing. Uh, of course I sometimes chat like say to you or others uh, that kind of turn it into more of a personal thing. But um, let, like it sometimes it's difficult. Like when when you talk about like object like like how you you try to keep your your I think that the word you mentioned was like it's a more of a what were you saying? Like well, with Twitter, it's yeah. more, it's more rapid fire. A you rapid don't have fire, that yeah. Filter of an yeah, editor the, the, there I, looking yeah, it over. I, I was thinking the other day, like there was on in Causeway Bay, I think it was on Sunday, mm -hmm. there was this incident where there was a group of police officers and emerging from an MTR exit in Causeway Bay, and then they had a tear gas grenade and they just kind of threw it and it appeared to hit just two journalists in the, in the backpack or in the head mm -hmm. on the helmet and then it ex exploded. And on that screen, you can't, cannot actually see any protester around. There's like a little cool gentleman in a, in a shirt. He's just filming everything. And then he walked that walk by, if you saw that. I actually put it on my own Twitter. Mm -hmm. But and then like the next day, I think there were some pro-government people who, shot, who show, shared like a video of what happened like maybe 30, 40 seconds before that grenade thing, which appeared to show uh, what the police version of the incident was. Like there were actually some protesters throwing rocks and other hard objects down the escalator mm -hmm. or the, the staircase. Mm -hmm. So uh, even though I had the clip, it was not actually the, what the, the, the full picture of the truth. Mm -hmm. It was just a, a, a 30 second of what happened. But what happened before those 30 seconds, mm -hmm. I couldn't actually show. So all I could do is that the next day, I had the police respond saying that, hey, uh, the, there were protesters who actually threw through something, mm -hmm. and I can only say, uh, you know, retweet my tweet and, and show that hey, I'm not trying to be just one-sided, mm -hmm. but I just didn't have the facts with me mm -hmm. at the time that I tweeted something. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, well, the other advantage of Twitter or social media is you can go around right away and repost when you get more information. Unlike uh, if you print something in the SCMP or on the RTHK website, it kind of lives there for a little bit longer. Aaron, let me bring you in as a representative of foreign media and a, a, tw a Twitter demon. Uh, you're on there all the time to explain, you know, explain how, when you're out there reporting, how uh, you're out there a lot tweeting as well. How, how much are you taking notes for stories versus what are you holding back for your stories? What are you putting out there right away when you know it? Well, I can just say I was actually there when they lobbed the Twitter grenade. I was in the back, maybe like 20 feet away, and I didn't see them throwing the rocks. I was, I, all I saw happening was I was walking around being like, I should put my gas mask on, but I'm too sweaty. And I was sort of struggling with it because there was like sweat pouring down my face. And, and then suddenly there was tear gas. And like, I was there. So something I've realized is just like, as someone on the ground, how difficult it is. Like, as a solo reporter, often you're like, I have to be walking around looking at what's happening. I have to watch the live stream. I have to look at Twitter to see, you know, what are other people tweeting? What is you know, Hong Kong hermit saying on his live stream. Um, he's actually a very important uh, non-journalist source. And like, you know, what is Anthony Dapperin saying? You know, like, so it's, 
it's hard. It's one of these events where, like, even if you were on the ground on the front line, you have very imperfect information, mm -hmm. and you're being sometimes asked to make calls on things that, like, you don't realize at the time, or you need to double check. So something I've learned is, like, I'm a freelance journalist, but, like, it's very difficult to work alone on this, and you really do need a team. And explain, yeah. how, how do you even know where to go when it's like water? Whew. Sometimes it's honestly like luck, like you're with the right group of people. Sometimes I've literally had to fall back and be like, I'm just going to watch what RTHK is streaming because like mm -hmm. I can't keep up with them or like as a print reporter, it doesn't really, I'm not a photographer, it doesn't make sense for me to like go to Wang Taisin and go out mm -hmm. really far into Kowloon. Mm -hmm. It actually, Anthony and I were talking about this, we're like, as a print reporter, maybe you should probably just stay home and watch Twitter and like watch the live stream and you'll probably actually get a better story and you can call out for quotes on Telegram, but that's obviously not what we want to do. We want to get the sense of color, but it's very challenging. Yeah, on the day of the strike, when we had the, the strike mm -hmm. and there were protests in like seven districts, I was uh, sitting in Sharon's house like like having a heart attack as I was watching the Telegram feed being like, tear gas here, tear gas here, tear gas here, tear gas here, and it was like everything is happening at once. This is a very complicated protest movement with more than one front. So it's it's been very challenging to cover, especially like if you're working alone, you know. I've been lucky to have a few editors who will work with me and I feed them string and then they put it together. But it's yeah, it's it's very unique in how multi front and, and constantly changing it okay. is. Yeah. Well that's great. We'll get back to that. Yeah. Let's let's um Let's shift a little bit and let's talk about the elephant in the room here, which is media bias. Everybody talks about media bias. So I'll have our, our professor and our lawyer author here first put on their hats as media analysts, and then I'll let the media kind of respond. Uh, the press has received co uh, criticism from both sides uh, for bias. One side says there's way too much emphasis on violent incidents by a relatively small number of radical protesters, and the press largely downplays peaceful protests that happen during the daytime where you get you know, hundreds of thousands, even a million people in the streets, but a few people at the end of it, a few knuckleheads start throwing bricks and that, that becomes the front page story. Uh, the other side says the media largely ignores violent acts by protesters, uh, protesters carrying dangerous weapons and injuries to police officers. The press only focuses on the police firing tear gas and aiming weapons, but they don't provide the context as to what happened before the tear gas and the rubber bullets. I mean, so we hear that both sides. And I always used to like to say that if you're getting criticized from both sides, you're probably doing it right. But <laughs> put, uh, Francis, can you put on your hat as a media analyst and tell me how do you see it? Is it okay? Is the pr press coverage okay? Is it biased one way, biased the other way? Well, uh, uh, I, I guess an academic, you know, just, just well, let, let me just really speak it from a very, very academic point of view. I, I think uh, 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 in media studies, we actually use to make a distinction between structural bias and political bias. So structural bias means what? Means, for example, the media have the tendency to focus on the front line, mm -hmm. on the sensational stuff, on the most violent stuff. Now, this kind of bias is what we usually call structural bias. It's not driven by political concerns. It's driven by how the press operates in a commercial kind of society, right? Uh, 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 how to, you know, address people, appeal to people's, you know, interest in being something very exciting, that kind of biases. And I think obviously that kind of structural bias exists, mm -hmm. as always, mm -hmm. as always. And, and, and it, it's not, for me, it's not a new thing uh, 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 in this product. Uh, uh, always, you know, the, the, the press in Hong Kong, in other parts of the world, would have that tendency to really focus on the most violent, most uh, 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 conflictual stuff. And so that is actually, a, 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 in one sense, it's a bad criticism to say that uh, very often, you know, you have a day of peaceful protest, and then in the last two or three hours, that, that was like back in late July and early August, that usually happened the case, right? So throughout the day, it was uh, relatively peaceful, and then uh, in the last two or three hours, you know, it became more, more violent. But basically, all the attention, the media attention, public attention, would be uh, uh, on, on to the last two or three hours. Um, that's uh, a very criticism, but also kind of actually very difficult, you know, a, a very entrenched problem mm -hmm. that has always been here. Uh, in terms of political bias, I would actually, uh, um, now, um, it is actually hard to judge because I have my political bias too. Uh, obviously, I have my political attitude. I, I, you know, when I write, I try to, of course, you know, uh, I'll resort to my research method and so pretend to be more neutral. Uh, <laughs> but obviously, everyone has a political attitude, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, so it's actually very hard to, to, to say for me to say my objective judgment is mm -hmm. 
that a press is objective or not objective. It's actually very difficult. But I would actually say one thing is that uh, uh, because we mentioned, you know, we mentioned the question of whether the press has become part of the story and whether that would lead to some kind of biases, or, or you know, the press, you know, uh, uh, seems to be paying more attention to police violence and things like that. Um, for me, again, it, it might not be a, a, a totally a new thing that that is applicable with only this project. Mm -hmm. For me, um, there is always an internal tension in what the liberal democratic theory of the press requires the press to do. It requires the press to be objective, but also requires the press to be critical to what power, to be critical to what government, to be the watchdog, to be the fourth essay, etc. Mm -hmm. So that tension actually is always here. It's always here. So basically, the, the, the dilemma or the, or, or the difficult job for the, for the journalist is that when you are in the, let's say, when you're in the, 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 the police or, or, or press conference, mm -hmm. when it's so obvious that the police officers are not making sense, mm -hmm. then what do you do, <laughs> right? I mean, do you, do you actually, you know, uh, uh, shout at the police or whatever? And that, of course, actually happens in a few uh, 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 press conferences or press freedoms, you know, uh, uh, against uh, uh, facing the police or facing Terry Lamb. Mm -hmm. And there was, of course, a debate. But, but uh, for me, it, it's actually just a manifestation of that tension that is always mm -hmm. in the idea of how the press mm -hmm. should operate. Yeah. Um, for, for me, I mean, it, it's a difficult negotiation, and, and, uh, um, but I do have to say, uh, uh, the press has been doing, in my, from my perspective, doing a fine job to, to try to mm -hmm. find the fine line mm -hmm. you know, between the competing considerations. Mm -hmm. And, uh, our second media analyst there. <laughs> you know, I mean, I guess I'd echo a lot of uh, what <laughs> Francis said. I mean, in that, that terms of that structural bias, I've seen plenty of that myself. I received a very unexpected call from um, Channel 7 Sunrise, which is like the biggest morning TV show in Australia. It's sort of for, you know, pensioners and retirees and sort of, you know, people who stay at home and don't go to work anymore. <laughs> and they wanted to talk to me about Hong Kong, and I was kind of surprised because, you know, international affairs and politics is not usually, it's normally like, you know, cooking and fitness and, and you know, animals and stuff. Um, but they said, okay, can you be on standby to, to, to appear on the show tomorrow morning, but we're only going to need you if it gets really violent. Um, <laughs> I said, okay. And, then, and indeed, obviously, it wasn't violent enough because they didn't call back. So um, <laughs> there you go. But no, I, I think that, um, the, the press have done a, 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 a fantastic job with this protest movement, um, partly because it's, it's gone on for long enough that there's a sort of enough space and time around it to start to really dig into a lot of the issues. It hasn't just been, you know, you know one weekend or a couple of weeks, and, and so all you get is the sort of flashbang, and then the, the, the subtlety disappears. But there's been a lot of, I think, really interesting analysis and deep dives and um, historical context um, and investigations. I think the, the, the New York Times investigative video of the Yunlong incident was, was amazing work. Um, so I think, yeah, the, the press have done a, a great work uh, sort of digging into these things and digging into these subtleties that you, you wouldn't normally get in a, in a, in a, in a fast-breaking new situation. So I think it's, it's, it's been spectacular. And, and just to also echo Francis's point that indeed you know, the, the, the whole speaking truth to power role of the press is, is really important. And you know, I don't have a lot of... Um, time for the argument, you know, why doesn't, you know, the press sort of tell the government story? I mean, the government is a government. They don't need help telling their story. They've got plenty of power themselves, so, yeah. Well, let me ask first the two local journalists and then our international journalists here. First, local journalist number one, Jeffy. Uh, how is it, you're, a, you know, from Hong Kong, you grew up here, you went to school here, and you see your city going through this kind of chaotic phase. How does that affect you when you're writing the stories or when you're covering the story? It's a very difficult time because you're like, I just say, like, I'm a lo Hong Kong local. I grew up here, I study here. And it's very hard to not to feel emotional. And especially when like, the, like with all the protests and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if you have watched the video of the orchestra version of the song, like at this difficult time, it's very hard not to feel emotional <laughs> yourself, but it's, you have to remind yourself, I have to remind myself, like, try my best to not to get my personal feelings inside my, rep in my report. Mm -hmm. in, like, to keep a distance. And just now, I would like to add a little bit more on Fra the point Francis Please, mentioned, yeah. because, like, talking about the misconception, there's, I think there's a misconception of the role of journalists when we cover the protests. First, it's the, some of the protesters, I'm afraid, like, mm -hmm. they may find, they may assume journalists are part of the team. 
that we are on, on site, they are here, they're there to protect us. Mm -hmm. And when you check Lin Dang on the LIHKG forum, you can say, okay, thank you, press, for standing in between the police and, uh, <laughs> 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 and the protesters or the pepper spray happened or something, something like this. And at the same time, you can see police also have a misconception, believing we are with the protesters. <laughs> you can see that, that like, they're increasingly hostile against us. You can see the they, call, yeah, they call us cockroaches as well. They call us corrupted journalists mm -hmm. because they thought we're the same. But the fact is we're not standing on any side. We're there to observe. We're not part of the story. So I think like, this tension also makes our job a bit difficult mm -hmm. yeah, in this sense. Da sure da Damon, can you comment on that too? I mean, what's it like being a Hong Konger here covering this thing? Well, I, uh, I try to be emotionless during work. When I get home, I cry. That's, that's what I do. Um, the thing is, like, uh, just to echo uh, Je Jeffy's point just now, like, uh, I was hit, uh, I think, when was that? Like, the August 11th. I was hit when I was in North Point. I remember. There was some, yeah, there was a pro government person who, who was apparently beating somebody up, like just a young guy in a black t-shirt and a mask. Just, I think others, other journalists covered his story and said he was just walking by, trying to buy some books, and then he just got beaten up by like perhaps the Fukunese gang. And then, and then I was trying to get up and, and, and film what was going on, and I was hit. And, uh, and, it's like, and, and that was the first time I remember that reporters were being called corrupted reporters. Like it was from the crowd, and then the police started picking it up, and and they would call journalists that. Uh, it is very, very like I mean, like I, I just when I think the the reason that I would say I would cry when I go home, it's not just for my own personal political views, it's more about the polarization. Like it's almost as if like uh, both sides, even though everybody is from Hong Kong like a police officer is from Hong Kong, like the protester is perhaps 14, 15 years old. They may have 50 years down the line living in Hong Kong, but they don't seem to be thinking about reconcil reconciliation or the government doesn't seem to think about, oh, okay, so maybe some, somebody, somebody liken it to like a cultural revolution-like atmosphere. It's like at schools, they encourage people to, uh, oh, you, you point to that classmate that you have and report that uh, he, may, he may have gone to a protest before, or that kind of thing. So, uh, like, that's what saddens me. But when I'm actually reporting, I, th this is not, like, part of the stories that I write, of course, because, well, it may be, now that I, I just spoke about it, it may, it may become a feature later on, but uh, <laughs> but when, when we do have time for features. But the, the thing is, it's, like, when you're working, uh, I guess, you just don't really have time to think about your 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 own position. Oh, uh, because I grew up in in uh, around the Monco area, like uh, the the Prince Edward Station. Actually, I I literally uh, that's where I go every day, like when I travel to work. So um, it's like it's like a lot. There are a lot of personal attachments, but but again, when you just walk when you're working, I just walk by, I take pictures. Uh, take pictures of the protests, and, and that's that's about it. Like you, you just have to try not to think that this is your home. You just have to pretend. <laughs> Maybe it's easier for Erin because he she wasn't uh, around here like before six years before this. But but you know it, it's it's you just have to try and stay emotionally detached. And, and can I just follow up with one thing? Because you work for RTHK, which is publicly funded. Do you ever have people coming up to you and saying, you should be reporting the government point of view? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, there were, yeah, of course. Like, people don't understand. Like, this is a history about RTHK itself, but I wouldn't go so much into that. We, we actually want, we are a public broadcaster. We try to be, if we are to be a mouthpiece, we, like, we try to be the mouthpiece of the people, right, and of the government. But of course, like, like the reason why I was beaten up uh, like a month ago, it was in, in part because I'm from RTHK, I think. Or not necessarily, I had a colleague also who was actually hit as well. I think he was hit in the face earlier on in the day when there weren't a, as many journalists around. So th there were of course like, oh, RTHK, you, you should be, you should be um, pro-government or you should be relaying the voice of the government more, uh, which we actually do sometimes. But uh, we do it perhaps a little bit more than the regular commercially funded 
broadcaster, but but we do it with not with with not be, not having like being a government mouthpiece in mind. We we do that in in terms of a public service, mm -hmm. uh, and and that's really it. So. Uh, of course, uh, uh, and and just to echo your your questions earlier on, we do get pro criticism from both sides. There are protesters who think we are too biased towards the government. There are pro-government people who think, oh, uh, you're too pro-protest. So, so I guess, as you said, we're probably doing a good job in that. Yeah. Yes, that's what I always say. And Aaron, uh, foreign media, you can be a bit more detached. Um, I mean, we all love Hong Kong, but we can also all get on a plane and leave at some point. That's also true. I do cry after the protests. It's usually the next morning. Um, I think it's it's like emotional exhaustion and uh, I think just you're holding it all in and you're running in like pure adrenaline sometimes for like 14 hours. Um, so I think sort of the odd thing about these protests in Hong Kong as a foreign reporter is there's a lot of foreign reporters who live here because this is a, a media hub. So sort of more than say a protest in like Bangkok or Phnom Penh, like the people who are reporting on this who are foreigners, I think largely do live here. And a lot of the people who I've seen who fly in are like Asian Americans who have some kind of tie to Hong Kong. Maybe they grew up here, now they live in like California or New York. So I think that this idea that like the foreign press, unless they're really flying in, they're parachuting in from like Paris or something, like I think a lot of them do in some sense have some kind of tie to Hong Kong. And Hong Kong is a very accessible society as a foreigner. Most people are very educated, they speak English. Um, you know, it's really easy to integrate in this in a way for a lot of foreigners, so especially the media. Um, so it's, it is, you know, you do have that attachment to the um, being uh, where you're from. And then, sorry, can you repeat well, your well, question well, 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 let me ask you this, because yeah. you, you stand out as a foreigner when you're at yeah. the protest. How are you treated by the protesters and how are you treated by the police? Any differently than the local reporters, you think? Um, I think as a visible foreigner, the police are definitely um, probably a little bit nicer to you, like not speaking Cantonese. I don't know what they're shouting at me. Um, <laughs> but they have been like, excuse me, excuse me, you know, I, I yeah, I'm like alone. I'm a like a blonde lady, you know, like hello, you know. So they they like I think anyone who is a white person in Hong Kong knows that the police sort of steer clear of you. Um, I, but I know that like Asian American journalists have had issues that just I have not had. Um, so I think if they sense that you're a foreigner, um, yeah. But it still is, you know, it's still hard to stay. Um, Objectivity is still difficult, right? Because like I'm American, like something that we're taught is like you know self determination, a very important American value, and you know democracy, and 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 keeping that stuff in check, that's a very easy bias to have as a Western person because you see Hong Kong people fighting for stuff that you've been like taught since you're in first grade, and you're like, I have to like keep my distance, and it actually has been oddly challenging, and made me reflect on a lot of stuff that. I've grown up with and my own personal values, yeah. And let me just ask all of you a, a quick question before we go to the audience. Uh, there have been a lot of reports of uh, police violence against journalists out there. Um, how much do you think, and I'll just start with you and we'll go down the line, how much do you think this is deliberate harassment of journalists to prevent them from doing their job and reporting police operations, or how much of it is that journalists just happen to be in the way <laughs> when they're trying to clear streets or, or stage operations? I, I think that like this weekend, um, I think Anthony referred to it in Causeway Bay, there was this point where there were like no journalists, uh, sorry, there were no protesters, about 150 journalists and, the, and some residents heckling the police and the police just started tear gassing everybody. I do kind of think the police genuinely are losing the plot and I think they seem to like get this sort of, as the night goes on, they get angrier and angrier and more worked up and they just start acting very quickly out and I think what happens now is the protesters disappear and there's a lot of journalists left and then I think they 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 are maybe not deliberate maybe it's not like planned anger but I think it does come out where they're just they're whatever they're worked up and, and they someone freaks out and they they pepper spray I mean a bunch of people were pepper sprayed this weekend for no reason you know so I think it's just that the government has mishandled this so badly and the police obviously are, are very angry and very overworked and mm -hmm. I mean I, that's not to justify anything but they are yeah. 
acting out, yeah. Journalists are overworked and... Well, yeah, <laughs> the police are taking it out of <laughs> the media. Uh, Damon, just, you, you've been on the front lines there. How much of this is just, there's so many journalists out there and when things are going on, if they're clearing a street, you know, they're going to get tear gassed. Or how much do you think it is deliberately aimed to kind of harass journalists? I, I think, like, it's not like policing and protests has been going on for, like, decades, right? When we go back to, let's say, the express rail controversy, like, 10 years ago, you wouldn't have seen, like, there may be, like, very close clashes. But let's say, I think it was the last weekend, the weekend before this, in Prince Edward, uh, there were a group of journalists who were pepper sprayed, and and the police explanation was they had to spray because they want to keep a further distance, which is not very logical, right? You can just verbally tell a group of journalists to, hey, stay back. <laughs> but that wasn't what happened. They just sprayed people, and, and the journalists were upset. And, and the next thing, the, the Journalist Association had to have a representative at the daily press conference to tell, uh, to, to to give a statement to the police expressing uh, disappointment and, and dissatisfaction. So I think, uh, adding a little bit to Aaron's point, I, I, I can sort of understand how worked up the, the officers are, especially the frontline ones. Maybe they have been over overtiming for like every day for like three months. But uh, again, to the point of, about uh, being trying to be objective while being critical to the authorities, to people with public power, public authority, uh, being having worked overtime for so long is not an, a reason for anybody to uh, abuse their power, put it that way. So uh, I don't want to say it's always deliberate, but the problem since I think the 12th of June has been that no police officer basically have been wearing their uniform numbers, so so they can basically do whatever they want. That's 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 just a very unfortunate situation. Jeffy, what have you seen? Talking about the disruption of our work, I will have to say the most annoying thing is the bright flashing light. <laughs> <laughs> like they have been flashing that light at us all the time, which makes it almost impossible to film what they are doing. I was told like apparently they brought that light because the pol the force also need to film something <coughs> at night and they need the light so they can film it uh -huh. and apparently it's not well executed by the frontline officers but anyway this is one thing very very annoying uh -huh. the other thing is i don't know since when journalists are barred from filming officers when they subdued the protesters on the ground i don't know like because it all takes place in the public area but like there's one time in Chiang and actually many <coughs> times, when they subdue the uh, protesters on the ground, they immediately block us with their shields and also, like, of course, just ask us to go away. And at, the, at one time, one officer even grabbed my wrist. I thought, am I breaking the law? Mm -hmm. Isn't it like a public area? I think mm -hmm. we're, like, we should be able to do our job, right? But they make us feel like we're breaking the law. So I, I think that's very, very annoying. I'm not sure. I'll slightly yeah. add to that. It, this is, has been happening even during the umbrella movement. Mm -hmm. Like when police make an arrest, they would surround the arrestee and try to block cameras view anyway. So it's not a new phenomenon, but mm -hmm. just when, when they have enough officers, they will always block it. But if they don't, then, then maybe they'll try to push you away. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Anthony, you have a thought on that? Yeah, um, I guess just, well, speaking briefly with my lawyer's hat on. Um, you know, there is um, a, a press pass isn't a, a magical get out of jail free card. Um, if you're if there's an illegal or unlawful assembly going on and you're standing in the crowd, then you know the first instance is that you know you are part of that unlawful assembly. So the police not arresting journalists or, or, or not arresting people with press cards in a, to a certain extent is sort of a, a courtesy that they're extending, recognizing that okay, you're you're clearly not identifying yourself with the protesters, you're, you're setting yourself apart from that crowd as, as a journalist, um, and they also sort of recognizing the bad PR that would ensue if they arrested a member of the press. But you know, I think members of the press do need to bear in mind that if there's a police operation going on and you're not distinguishable from the rest of the crowd, then you're gonna be treated like part of the crowd. Um, and there was a, uh, I won't name names, but a, a foreign correspondent who um, had his mask broken by a rubber bullet, um, and made quite a big deal of that. I saw that same foreign correspondent standing 
Well, assuming that the front row of the audience here were police with rifles firing rubber bullets and, and Jeffy and Damon are protesters holding bricks, the place to stand is not there. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you, I think it, there is a certain degree to which you know, journalists need to exercise mm. a certain degree of, of just you know, self-care. Yeah. Just follow up on your first point. You said the police, with, uh, they weren't respecting the press card. or where, what, what, is a, what is an official press card in Hong Kong? That's, that's a great point also. I mean, we have the Hong Kong Journalists Association and they issue press cards. Um, and if you're a member of the HKJA or a member of another national press organization, you can apply for an international press card. Um, but, you know, that again doesn't really have any particular legal status. Um, people from other international organizations may just have their, you know, the, 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 the press affiliation of their home organization or um, might just be wearing their, the, the pass to get into their office. You know, if you work for Bloomberg and you're wearing your Bloomberg pass, something like that. Um, so there is no official sort of law, legal definition of what is a, a legally recognized press card because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't exist. Interesting. Francis, last thought before we get to the audience about that point. Well, um I, I guess my my hypothesis, so to speak, okay, is is that um, well, I, I wouldn't say the police is deliberately uh, 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 targeting journalists, but I guess uh, um, the the root of the problem is um, the training of the police or the the, the, the culture, internal culture of, of among the police officers. You know, what do they believe and what do they understand? Uh, it, it's not just about the the, the press. I mean, I, I think you know their violence against the protesters. They genuinely don't understand what it means to have the right to protest. They genuinely don't exactly understand protesters as exercising their citizen rights. They genuinely believe that these people are lawbreakers, right? And so they actually think that they are doing the right thing in exercising uh, 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 I mean, their power against the protesters. Now for the press, I do, I do believe that they do understand that the press is doing their job, but now, you think about this, you know, for us, uh, 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 people doing journalism, teaching journalism, studying journalism, uh, we, we, our understanding is that journalism is not just a job. It is doing a very important social service. It's a very important part of a liberal democratic society, right? It's uh, 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 doing, extremely doing something extremely important. Um, it's not just any job. Um, but I, again, my hypothesis is that I don't think the police actually understand this. And so they actually just see the press as, oh, you know, you, I understand you're doing your jobs, but your jobs are making my job extremely difficult, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, even though, you know, I, I might not exactly see you as troublemakers, but if you actually uh, are making my jobs very, very difficult, then I might actually hate you, mm -hmm. right? And then in the front line, you, you know, in, in, in those times of, you know, after hours of confrontation, people just mm -hmm. easily lose control emotionally mm -hmm. and behaviorally. Yeah, so, so I, I, I tend to see that as mm -hmm. the, the, the background for this kind of occasional violence against the press more than a very deliberate attempt mm -hmm. to, to, to suppress the press. Yeah. Thank you for that. And I know we've got some audience questions. We've got a couple of microphones here. I'm going to take the first ones here in the front row because I see them. <laughs> uh, Graham Akers right here in the front row. Sorry, I'll get to the other rows too, but I have to go for journalism students first because I know them. And please make your questions, uh, just say who you are and then make your questions as brief and concise as possible and direct it to which panelist if you want. Um, hi guys, I'm Graham, I'm one of the two former students in the context there. Mm -hmm. And actually, my question is a little bit about that, but it's more for our entry in the center, right? And I was curious, since you've analyzed the previous solution, and now we're looking at more of a decentralized structure entry, what kind of problems do you think we can foresee for? Well, uh -huh. No. Oh. Okay. Sorry, guys. Actually, it's probably better. So we go to this idea of either implementing the five demands and with some sort of consistent consensus or possibly even negotiations with the government. How do you foresee that? And I'm aware I'm asking you to speculate. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is interesting that, you know, uh, sort of where the five demands came from in the first place in itself is sort of a, an interesting question. It sort of bubbled up from the online forums and, and, and sort of you know, various places that they've been articulated and then modified over time. Um, but I I indeed, not only the five demands, but how do you then you know, negotiate or compromise around them um, is an interesting question. And in a way, that, that's sort of 
the challenge that the government faces in trying to figure out what policy response will keep enough people happy to sort of take the steam out of the moment, um, uh, the movement rather. I don't think they've um, achieved that yet, obviously. Um, but I guess the other sort of alternative side of, of the argument is, you know, it's maybe not a negotiation that needs to happen. In the end, what people are, are asking for and the five demands are trying to articulate is just a better governance, a, you know, a more responsive government that's listening and responding to the people and, and then a more representative means of, of that government being selected. Um, and they're not necessarily o open to negotiation. Um, so if the government's going to try and find a way to resolve the crisis, they can try and find other policy means of doing it, but a negotiation or a compromise is not necessarily um, what anyone you know, is, is interested in, in, in seeing. So, yeah. Can we, uh, ge uh, the gentleman in the fourth row in the white shirt had his hand up here for a long time. Yeah. And then we'll qu come back over here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm a Hong Kong born, okay, people, and this is my home. And when the people say that they cry, you know, I also cry because Hong Kong is my home. Okay, I can see this is really, really bad for Hong Kong. Now I, I do have uh, some three questions. The first one is, I know that every journalist, they are, they are difficult to be non-biased because they have their, their, I mean, either one side or the other. For example, I look at, uh, Jeffy, he mentioned that it, the flashing light from the police is very annoying. But what about the laser guns, okay, from the protester? Because his camera is looking at the police. Okay, one thing. So the bias is okay, I mean. But now the first question is, I know that there's structure bias, okay? But do you have a standard of moral standard? Do you want to see, do you want to condemn violence? When you see the people, they are breaking the law, okay? Destroying our subway stations, destroying the traffic lights, okay? Breaking, making bricks. Do you allow this thing? Why don't you report this thing? Tell him that condemn violence is bad. That's the first question, rather than just a bias, okay? Because this is the fundamental moral, mm -hmm. the, the legal system. Mm -hmm. The second question is, what do you think the standard of the journalist in Hong Kong Okay, are the journalists always standing between the police and the wild, wilder, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, the rioter? Why they can't stand on the other side? I mean, why they won't stand in the middle? Another thing is, I also, I also get the information from the live broadcast. Mm -hmm. During the press conference, the out TV, the, the journalist, mm -hmm. they never allow, okay, the police, try to interrupt the police many times, and it's not really getting information. It's mm -hmm. questioning, okay? And also ask questions, okay? Very biased questions. You can see that from live broadcast. Okay. The yep. third question yeah. is, okay, uh, this is addressed to Anthony and Christy. Mm -hmm. How do you compare Hong Kong police with the overseas police violence? Okay. Okay? <laughs> All right. <laughs> I mean, okay, let's uh, let's bad. okay, let's take those uh, one at a time, uh, Jeffy. Uh, should, uh, should the journalists be condemning violence, or should they um, should they just be reporting what they see? I'm afraid it's not really our job to condemn violence because we're the we have to be fair in our coverage. So if I let the story, like imagine a front page story on the SCMP saying violence co condemn pro protesters or police. Violence. What is it? They like people would dismiss our report, and because we have lost our objectivity and fairness, we, what our job should be is to report what happened on the both sides, which we have been. I'm sure a lot of press have been. Like we are not just focusing on, like the the police brutality. We are not focusing on that. We have also shown pictures of how they throw a hundred petrol bombs in just one single day. I think it's all in our coverage. So I think. Our job more is to report what both sides have done okay. fairly. And, and what about his second question? I mean, uh, asking challenging questions at, to the police and I suppose to the chief executive. I mean, I think that's what journalists normally uh, do, I though, right? I think that's our job as well. I think the public wants us to do this job as well. Do you want? I think I think uh, what the gentleman there was. Uh, if you talk about the the uh, the, the the choice of words, I kind of agree that at times. 
uh, in some instances, the, 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 the level of uh, ferocity in the questioning could have been a bit more subtle. But there's a little background to that because uh, I think two of the cases, they are actually my colleagues who, who actually uh, at different divisions who, who did the very exhaustive questioning, like say stopping the, 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 the person from responding. But I think that the, the, the argument at that point was that the, the interviewee were not actually directly answering the questions. And that was what prompted the, the, the reporter to be, to, to keep on shouting or interrupting the, 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 un the answers. But uh, I, I would tend to agree, it's still rather impolite to, to interrupt so often. Like, I mean, if you interrupt like once or twice, maybe that's okay. But I, I think the instances that the gentleman there is referring to, like it was very frequent interruptions, which I personally also may have reservations. But, but the, I think that the rationale, the reason behind is, it's, as I said, it's because the interviewee was seen or is understood by the public to not be, to be very evasive for the questions. It's not just the local press. There, that being, I think the Reuters reporter also had, uh, 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 was asking Carrie Lam, he literally pointed out that Mrs. Lam was evading the question, I think three times, and Mrs. Lam just ignored him and went to the next one, so. Uh, any of our foreigners here would like to comment on how the... <laughs> uh, I think the questions are relevant. I mean, you know, if you survey the world, I'm sure you'll find police that are more violent and police that are less violent, but the only relevant question is what the police are doing here now and whether that's appropriate or not. I don't see a comparison. <laughs> uh, let's go over here. Sorry, I've got a couple. Keep your hands up. No, just right here first. And then I'll Thank get you. it to everybody, don't worry. <laughs> I would like to thank all the participants. The session has been incredibly, incredibly informative. I teach European studies here at the University of Hong Kong, and I have lived in Hong Kong for six years and I, I, I observed the development with, with great interest and I want to thank you for, for all your Twitter feeds also. <laughs> but I, I have two very brief questions. One is about uh, the title of this session. Do you agree that, that we live in a polarized society or is it rather what I observe is a remarkable degree of unity of so within society, of society against the government that is mishandling uh, things and that is attempting to create an authoritative regime, aut authoritarian a regime, uh, and it's unlikely to succeed, and that's my second question, it's unlikely to succeed in that project unless and until it abolishes the freedom of press. So what I find striking is that there are these repressive measures, but accompanied by very rigorous uh, reporting. I grew up in communist Czechoslovakia, that was a repressive regime. There was no police brutality, that was visible, right? There was certainly no reporting of that kind. So I, I can't see this conflict continuing along these lines, because it's a contest for uh, minds and heart of, of the citizens, and the government cannot prevail unless and until it shuts down uh, the free press. So do you have that fear? And that means also that there is no way you can be non-partisan, because if, if that uh, contest is lost, then you have no job. Do okay. you have a comment on that, Francis? Well, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I guess there are two parts of the question, right? The first part is you know, whether it's actually a polarized society. I, I, I perfectly agree that you know, uh, when compared to the sort of past, you know, many controversies in the past, uh, public opinion in this process has been relatively much more one-sided, okay? But it doesn't mean that the government does not have its own very vocal support. Actually, you know, just uh, uh, going back to, to the poll that we have just, uh, uh, we have just did, um, we asked the question, okay, uh, ask people whether you trust the police. Now, uh, the, from a zero to 10 scale, okay? Uh, 10 means you no know, trust very highly, zero means you know, no trust at all. Uh, the average score is only two point something this time. Okay, it's actually very low. But if you actually look at the scores, actually, 48.7% of people gave zero. So a large percentage just gave zero. But at the same time, 10.7%, if I remember correctly, gave 10. So, so a lot of people actually move very far to the other side. So in that sense. Although it's actually imbalanced, right, 48.7% versus 10%, but you do have a percent, you know, a, a certain proportion of people who really go very far to the other side supporting the police, supporting uh, uh, the government. That, I, I think that's what, you know, is the basis on which we might claim that it's actually uh, 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 pretty polarized. 
and I think you know whether it's, it's going to prevail or succeed. And actually, I think that's also the way, the reason why you know, uh, 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 um, especially the participants you know, um, in the past uh, a few a few weeks, the key word, you know, the intent means the call on how, right? Okay, the key, one of the key words, one of the key words that has been discussed uh, uh, by a lot by uh, um, by the participants is basically the idea that you know burning together. So basically, I think you know uh, um, that's also uh, uh, why there has been a lot of these discussions about uh, whether the government actually, the Chinese government is actually going to stand up PLA, et cetera, et cetera. Because in one sense, it's true that it will, it has come to the point of will very soon come to the point uh, 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 that the government has to make a big decision. It's a significant concession, or it's going to be a significant repression. Uh, right now, it's still trying to just, you know, let it die down, but if it's not going to work, it seems like it's not going to work, right? But in the end, it's either a concession or a severe repression. Okay, let's get a few more in. I want to please keep your questions short so we can get in as many as we so, can. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you'll get one first. This okay. is here first. So uh, my, my name is Shamir, and uh, I would like to ask the question focusing on the, the social media. As one of the gentlemen who constantly is uh, <laughs> in his uh, Twitter, so the, the flow of the information has been, I mean, exhausting. So much of information is passed, and lo a lot of fake news uh, incidents has, have happened. Uh, examples include the, the camera lamppost and, you know, you know the fake news. So there's, there has been a lot of factors. So do you think, how important do you think the, the flow of information should be in social media, given that a lot of fake news has been circulating in, in Facebook and even in Twitter? So how important do you think media literacy is to, you know, the common man, to the common people? Yeah, that's my question. Well, uh, Damon, you want to take that? I, I think it's very important, but uh, it's very hard, like, for journalists to be fact-checking, to be f to be honest. Like, say, the, the Prince Edward MTR station incident, uh, it's still, like, uh, developing as we speak. Uh, uh, the fire services gave their version, but there's more evidence emerging. But um, as a journalist myself, I would have to say I try very hard uh, just to like triple check before I post anything on Twitter because I don't want to be the source of fake news myself. So uh, mostly I only post things that uh, originate that originate from myself, like that that I have checked myself. But I wanted I wanted to go back right a little bit to the, 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 uh, this person's. You're from Czech Republic, right? Um, uh, Slovakia. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Uh, but um, the point is, I think uh, if the government is talking about the emergency laws, uh, one point that ha had been raised is about shutting down the free press or at least limiting part of it. Let's say if they are to shut down Telegram or uh, LHKG, the forum, or like the press may be limited in some sense, e even if they just shut down those two, two channels or, or platforms, that would be a limit on free speech. So, so uh, in a sense, that would be pretty disastrous for Hong Kong as an international city. But uh, that has been, as I understand, uh, part of what the government's been thinking. Uh, one question here, and then yeah. one here, and then pink shirt in the back. Yeah. Uh, I'm Claudia. I work for the South China Morning Post as well as a vi uh, senior video producer. Um, I heard the panel talk about two trends that I find rather interesting. Um, one is about live feeds being one of the major sources for people like the general public to get their news. And the other one is that at certain occasions at the protests there tend to be more reporters than either protesters or police. So I find these two quite interesting trends in journalism, and as journalists, I would be very interesting to hear you uh, address these, uh, these, these trends. Who wants to? <laughs> How about I start Once first and start, then Francis yeah. can supplement. So actually, I tried to talk to some protesters when I interviewed them and asked, like, what's your source of news? And most of them indeed telling me, of course, it's from live feed. Uh, live feed. The reason is because there are so many short videos circulated on WhatsApp and also on Facebook, which uh, even though they are real, they did not show the full picture. One of the example is what happened outside the Kwai Fong police station, where there's a policeman holding a gun, pointing the gun at the protesters. So like from the protesters' side, they was like, oh my God, how can you do this to the people? They're just blah, 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 blah. 
And then on the other side, the um, um, government supporters camp, they, they are circulating another, exactly another video, which shows like how the protesters have hurled bricks at the police. So two groups of people are sharing totally different videos on the same incident and no one got the true or, or the full picture of it. So that's why people might tend to rely on the live broadcast because they feel like I, I don't really trust these information. I would rather see it myself. See it themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one quick comment on that too? Yes, I, I think, you know, it's, uh, uh, there, is, there are actually many reasons why people prefer like this. You know, it's immediate, it's, uh, 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 you seem to be being there, uh, uh, things like that. And I think one, but, but one fundamental question about, I, I think for journalism scholars or for journalists, okay, one fundamental question is, is live broadcasting journalism at all, yeah. right? Because actually, you know, if, if you just put a camera here and then do live feed, right? Are you actually doing journalism? You know, is, it, is the camera really doing journalism here, right? Or is it just showing mm -hmm. the panel discussion mm -hmm. when audience? And I, I think journalism, the fundamental idea is that we're telling stories. We're yeah. telling stories by collecting information and then articulating them yeah. into a story that is meaningful, mm -hmm. right? So that is actually the classic idea of journalism, which is mm -hmm. actually quite different from live broadcasting. Mm -hmm. uh, although we are in the world of live broadcasting now. So, so it's actually a, a kind of a very interesting trend. But yes, I mean, there, there is actually tension between the prevalence of live broadcasting and the very classic mm -hmm. idea of what journalism should be. Mm -hmm. Great. Yes, OK. I Th thank you so much. The, all, all your information has been very insightful and uh, very inspira inspirational. And uh, Mr. Richburg, I'm a big fan of yours. Uh, <laughs> by the way, my, my major is computer science, okay. but uh, I, I consider myself a journalist at heart. And uh, <laughs> what, what, what I believe is that, uh, so my question to you is, what do you think is the media? What what does the me? Uh, what does what do the people who in mainland China believe about the media in, in Hong Kong? Who are like who who do not believe everything what the Chinese government says? Does anybody want to take a shot at? Uh, <laughs> I I do customer sentiment analysis on Twitter. <laughs> people in the mainland. What what do they believe about what's happening in Hong Kong? Do we, does anybody? We're all here, so we're not sure. <laughs> you want to take a stab? I, I, can, at it? I can try and take that. I think I think you meant like mainland people who do not believe the mainland government, right? Did you say that you, you're referring to the mainland people who do not believe the mainland government? Yes, 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 yes. Right. They I think. I, right. I I I think there are two groups. Like there there are those who who do believe in the government, but as you as you're trying to ask about those who don't. Uh, they are, some of them are actually on Twitter. They can somehow get on VPNs and they, they, they break the great firewall. And then they start to follow activists or even journalists' feed. So on my Twitter, I sometimes get like ma apparent mainlanders who were, who were uh, discussing what I post. And they, they do uh, tend to be pretty liberal. They, they tend to say, s express support for the Hong Kong uh, movements and also this and that, but then of course they I, I would have to I would tend to believe they're in the minority because if I go on Weibo I actually don't have an account but I, I, I understand that there are people who who call journalists in Hong Kong uh, yellow uh, media yellow being the color of the umbrella movement so um, I think uh, again uh, the the campaign e even state media they would. Uh, Accuse the Journalists Association in is issuing pre uh, fake press cards, so you can see the level of attacks against local journalists is actually quite high. Uh, it, it it goes to the state level. Uh, for the People's Daily said uh, accused the JA of issuing very cheap press cards when that's not true. We had a I, I was on the on the ex exco of uh, the JA quite a few years back, but we try very hard to go through every single application. And there was one case where uh, there was like a, a columnist who barely make, make his income from, from writing columns. But we try very hard not to give him the press card. But in the end, I think he won by one vote, like six to five, he was issued a press card. But, but again, the JA has a very uh, stringent process in issuing press cards. Do you, do you have a yeah.
This isn't about China, but just about also outside of Asia. Um, there's sort of, there's also people on the far left in America who think that these protests are the work of the US government. And <laughs> I'm like, yes, Asian people also believe in democracy too. Like they don't need to be paid by the CIA to do that. Yeah, like, so there, there's that in America. And also like Americans seem to think they're like, is all of Hong Kong on fire? Are you safe? And I'm like, there was a mass shooting in America. Are you safe? Like, <laughs> there's, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> there's a lot. Of, it's not just China that has these misconceptions. It's like all over the world. So like, yeah. it's not like you can have a free internet and not get what's yeah. going on. So just like keep those two things in mind. Yeah. Did you have a point on that, Jeffy? Or good. Uh, pink shirt back there. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. okay, we have a question back here. Uh, Ray Cheung from Chinese U University. I, I want to talk, uh, make a comment on objectivity because to be objective doesn't mean to take care of both sides because if you take care of both sides, it's contingent on the social uh, atmosphere. To be objective, I think, is to face the fact. If the fact is that the police use excessive force, it, if the fact is that it's illegal to use excessive force, uh, such as when the protester is... Uh, not uh, resisting and they still use excessive, still use force that's excessive. That's a fact. You don't have to take care of both sides and present this uh, opinion and that opinion to pretend okay. to be. Okay. Do you have a question or? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well. Or do you want to comment then the comment on your com comment? It's a comment about okay. what 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 it is to be objective. Yeah. Uh, okay. More like a comment. So sorry, that's not a question. Okay. Yeah. What objectivity? Should it be both si one side on the other side or what? Anybody? <laughs> Let me put it this way. Uh, 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 I personally would, would say uh, we might. One way to understand the word objectivity is to is to think about you know its opposite subjectivity, right? So uh, uh, being objective is basically not being subjective, trying to be not subjective. Now, so what is what does it mean to be subjective? Now, I, I just mentioned like every one of us, I believe we have attitude. In fact, it is perfectly normal and, and, and almost inevitable that journalists would have attitude. I, I can't see why if you are not a, a person who care about a society, why would you be a journalist? And if you care about society, it's so natural that you will have attitudes on social political issues. So that's impossible that for people not to have attitudes. But I think to be try to trying to be not so subjective or non-subjective is basically how we constrain when we work, how we constrain ourselves. So let's say if I'm a researcher, I, I can't speak you know, uh, 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 from a journalist viewpoint. As a researcher, I have my attitude. But when I do my research, my attitude is constrained. It's constrained by research method. It's constrained by facts. It's constrained by logic. It's constrained by reason. It's constrained by a lot of things. Okay, that I have to respect, right? So that if I actually follow all these constraints, so my outcome, my research outcome, will be objective, in the sense that it's actually protected by all these, all those constraints. So the outcome is not colored by my subjective attitude, at least not too much. So I, I think that is at least how I understand, you know, how researchers or journalists can approach the notion of objectivity. Mm -hmm. I'll very quickly supplement. Yep. There's a reason these uh, department have a CH, a CH case <laughs> journalism. Uh, my, my, to, to supplement, my rule of thumb is facts, news value, and like when I start a story, I write with the with in good faith that everything it's it's just about how worthy it is like it's it's not about what I think what happened it's about what actually happened why is it important to people and then I write it that way so it's it's all facts that's all it is okay. we can slip in a couple more if the, the questions are nice and concise one microphone's already there go ahead um, my name is Robin Hibbert I'm a master's of journalism student here and Anthony you made the comment I thought quite interesting about protest becoming like theater uh, and that the press or the media was becoming the audience. I guess my question is, um, if there was a protest and the press didn't show up, um, where would we be? And does the media um, have any responsibility in terms of um, not covering things um, in order to not give an audience um, to activity? Good question in relation to the President of the United States. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, 
look, certainly part of the purpose of a protest is to draw attention to the cause. And so you know, the, the, one of the purposes of getting out onto the street is to get media coverage to sort of have the, the word of, of their issue and their viewpoint of the issue spread to the wider community. And in the case of the ongoing protests in Hong Kong too, the protesters are very aware of the role of the international media and wanting to spread the word about their cause internationally and to, to foreign governments as well. So, yeah, certainly the, the, the media have a key role in the protesters' mind of what they're trying to achieve. Um, uh, I, I think, you know, if the media didn't turn up, you know, the, the protest would probably still go on. Um, I think, you know, certainly there's a certain responsibility that the, the, the press have to cover it in any event. But, um, you know, yeah, there's always a, a, a judgment to be made. I think it goes back to, to Damon's points just now about, about newsworthiness and, and, you know, as to whether something should be covered or not. But, uh, Certainly, the protesters are very keenly aware of the dynamic. But then, uh, uh, sometimes, like, say, in the last few nights when uh, there are protesters singing the song Glory to Hong Kong at shopping malls, there are times, like, everybody can, can just kind of report, not perhaps not actually reporting, but there people can shoot a video of people singing, and then news outlets can use it and put it on their platform. So if you're talking about, like, if... A news event doesn't have a journalist, like a, a news organization journalist there. It can always be picked up by somebody who actually shot what happened, and they can use the footage so long as they get consent. So I, I, I hope that partially answers your question. So I was going to supplement as well. The other interesting question is how it's presented. So um, someone observing, so in a discussion with someone observing actually SCMP's coverage of some of the protests noted that um, sometimes the way a protest is covered is as a law and order issue, as, as, as by the crime reporter under the crime beat, rather than by Jeffrey and her politics team under the political column. So it, it, how something is categorized and then reported upon is also interesting, even if you're reporting the same event. I'm just letting us run over a couple minutes because we started late. Uh, you have a mic, go ahead. Yes, Quick um, question. Yeah. My question is on uh, following up on the live broadcast because uh, it's easier to remain objective during the, the print media because we can choose. But for now, when live broadcasts become um, a, a trend, uh, people, uh, reporters follow uh, protesters to go on to 42C bus and people accuse us of uh, disclosing where they're going and make them get arrested. So where does it start and where does it end? Like what is the line of objectivity in live broadcasts? Thank you. Anyone? Well, you, you can you can keep it, Anthony, if you like. I, I'll yeah. give it a go. Uh, I've got plenty of journalist friends on on my Facebook feed. Like the the incident you mentioned, the the arrest in Cullen Bay. Uh, a lot of people were criticizing, like uh, photographers or, or whatnot, uh, because like when a group of protesters, let's say they're actually damaging, like throwing bricks or vandalizing something, that's newsworthy. You you should be live broadcasting that. But when they were just on a bus or they're traveling somewhere, uh, is it really worth putting it out li as live? That's really controversial. It, it ended up being uh, something that was a lead up for the police to actually chase the car and the vehicle and stop them and arrest. And another thing about objectivity of live broadcasts, after all, let's say the two cameras here, they're actually both pointing at the panel. Let's say somebody's starting a fire at the back. We can't see it. So if, if you understand my point, like the camera, the live feed itself, it's already not objective. They are shooting at an angle which is considered to be newsworthy by the camera operator. So uh, the, 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 the mind, the, the, the thinking of live feeds being, you know, I'm seeing the truth, that's actually also not quite the truth if you, if you come to think of it. Mm -hmm. Just one right here. Yes. Right. So I feel, I'm, um, this is Evelyn here, I'm also a journalism student here. I feel like so far, like we journalists think we're doing a very meaningful social service, we're doing our job right in this event. But there's a very practical question. Apparently you guys all think we're so far doing okay, but if the audience, the readers of your newspaper do not perceive that you are doing a fair job, what should you do or what should we journalists do? You guys somehow like laughed at the question that gentleman raised, but he's one of the re readers as well. So if you're doing the fair reporting, but the readers do not perceive it that way, what should we do? And I feel that connects to the ultimate role of journalists as well. Are we, do we perceive ourselves as the you know, motivation or a helper for the negotiation in the society to happen? Or do we just 
you know, as an objective ob like observer, like we just record what's happening here and we do ha not have any responsibility to push forward the negotiation. So this is what I'm thinking. Aaron? So journalism in Hong Kong is a capitalist enterprise, right? So there's many options. So we're, no one is making you read a certain newspaper. If you don't like the coverage, you don't subscribe, you don't click on the ads. You can choose to read what you want to. And one reason why we have public broadcasters is like our THK is they're supposed to kind of be in the middle of that. But SCMP will lean one way. You know, HK1 will lead another way. So you choose what you want to read. We have many options. So it's kind of the onus is on the reader to decide how they want to choose their information platform. And I think that um, in English tradition of media, uh, European media is a little bit different, but we're not really advocating for stuff as such, maybe they will in the comment section, but I think you see that maybe in French media and yeah, there's a different tradition in Anglo-Saxon media where we're not telling people to solve a problem in the news page. That's for the comment section. So Francis? that's what I would say to that. I, I guess, you know, uh, on the first part of the question, you know, view of the public perceive, the press is biased, you know, what, we, what should we do now? Uh, first of all, I, I think it's extremely difficult because uh, again, um, uh, in media studies, there was actually a concept for hostile media perception. There have been a lot of studies, experimental studies, showing that you show the same uh, uh, TV news to, let's say, the original study was in Israel. So they show the same television news cast to a group of Israeli, a group of Palestin Palestinians. They say they were watching, watching exactly the same thing. And, and after watching the thing, they were asked whether the coverage newscast is biased. The Palestinians thought about the, the newscast was biased against them. And the Israelis also thought the same newscast was biased against them. So uh, that's why the term hostile media perception, everyone thinks the media is biased against them and toward the other side. So in one sense, there, now of course there is a, a whole body of psychological literature explaining why that happened. But I think the point is that you know, it's actually very hard, right? Uh, um, that kind of bias perception always happens. But I guess um, what to do is not so much just what the press should do, but what uh, uh, maybe they do. I guess that's also part of the reason why we are having this kind of panel, right? Mm -hmm. We talk to people, we introduce, you know, we explain our values, we explain our principles, right? We communicate with the public through various ways. And I think that is actually, you know, actually uh, uh, some uh, 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 member of the audience mentioned the term media literacy, mm -hmm. right? So I, I think that is what we should do, not only as media, but also as state school. I mm -hmm. think that could help, uh, 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 um, help the audience, help members of the public, to have a better perspective of actually how to evaluate the press, how to understand the press. Okay, I think that's going to have to be the last word because we've run out of time now. Um, but I want to—I know a lot of you had your hands up and you've been disappointed you didn't get your question answered. But that means we're going to have to have another one of these panels um, coming up very soon because I can see how much interest there is in this. Um, please go. You can watch this on YouTube when it's uploaded to our YouTube channel, and you can leave a question or a comment there, and we'll see if we can do something with that. Um, Thank you. I was just going to say, um, all but uh, Professor Lee um, are on Twitter. So if you have questions, go on Twitter <laughs> and DM them. They're all on Twitter. Thank you, Pro Professor Francis Lee, Anthony Dapperin, Jeffy Lamb, Damon Pong, and Aaron. Aaron Hale, thanks very much. Thank you.